to bring new people in to understand and experience what it is that we think is so cool about guns. So thanks to John. Uh, good luck to you. I really hope it succeeds. And I hope some of the other folks watching end up being uh, your customers in the future. Now, on to our next question. Bob, Bob G, says, Considering that all prior attempts at direct gas impingement systems failed rather spectacularly, why did Stoner adopt that system? Why did the U.S. military accept it? Uh, well, I think there's a false premise in the question. Um, previous attempts at direct gas impingement actually were fairly successful. Um, there are really only kind of two main ones, the, the Swedish Jungmann, which was a reasonably successful gun and developed in a remarkably short period of time. Of course, Sweden didn't really get into a significant major conflict, military conflict, with those rifles the way a lot of other countries did, so, too. Um, there, so there wasn't a lot of military combat field use of the Jungmann, uh, although it was a good enough design that it did get exported out to Egypt. They decided to manufacture them under license as in both 7.62x39 as the Rashid and an 8 Mauser as the Hakeem rifle. But the Jungmann was a good gun, and it is straight direct gas blowback, or direct gas impingement. Um, the other one, of course, is the whole French series. The French started with the Moss 1940, and then the 1944, which was actually put into production, quickly revised as the Moss 49, which worked pretty well, and they decided, well, we can lighten this, make it a little handier, turned into the 49-56. All of those are also pure direct gas impingement, and they work extremely well. Um, so I would call direct gas impingement a system that is not hugely common, but certainly not one that you could ever reasonably call disastrous or unsuccessful. Now, in the AR-15, in the stoner system, you actually don't have direct gas impingement. What you have is a gas piston that 